respect to the Canadian situation, the difference is that we peaked at about uh, 15%, and now we're probably somewhere around 13.5%. Uh, so we haven't made as much progress. The, di the reason is that we've continued to add to debt, and if you uh, sort of uh, read the papers or see TV on a regular basis, that's certainly one of the warnings that uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada is consistently pointing out is that there is a risk in terms of the Canadian households that uh, their debt levels have continued to, to increase. At this point, what we're saying is if you look at how much, how hard it is for them to finance uh, that debt burden at this point, it's not problematic, but should interest rates increase, uh, then it would be a problem. And I think that's really what the governor is really trying to uh, point out to people is it's fine in a low rate environment. However, be prepared that we're not going to be in this low rate environment forever. Um, and that takes us to the next chart, which is really one of the things that we have seen is globally since the uh, beginning of the economic downturn, every central bank across the world took action to uh, help alleviate the problem. And so here in North America, the U.S. short-term interest rates, which used to be in excess of 5%, were dragged down to a quarter. They are still at those levels. And what Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke has told us is that he will maintain rates at that level as long as is necessary, even if it's to 2015 as required. Here in Canada, uh, same sort of thing. Our rates used to be in excess of 4%. They, brought down, they were brought down to a quarter. They have since edged up to about 1%, and our view is that the Bank of Canada will maintain rates at that level uh, through at least 2013 and likely into 2014 as well. China, uh, Brazil, uh, they brought their rates down. However, as their economies gained significant momentum in 2010, much of 2011, they spent their time actually increasing rates. And what we've seen over the past year is that those policies have been reversed. So especially Brazil cut rates significantly over the past year, and China did a little bit. So the point here is if those two countries, those, those two countries now have changed course from being a tightening bias where they were most of last year, so they will continue to act to support growth going forward. And the other chart just shows you inflation rates. The key point there is that inflation throughout most of the world is fairly low, and that pro provides central banks the ability to continue to keep low rates as well. And this is, these charts are now specific a little bit more to the auto sector, which uh, is a key uh, industry for uh, Durham. And the first chart just shows you what one of the indicators that we've developed which looks at um, the ability of Americans to go out and buy a new vehicle. And the, the key point here is it turns before uh, vehicle sales uh, turn, and, and that's really what the key point here is. What we're trying to gauge is are conditions improving for a U.S. buyer of a new vehicle, or are they deteriorating? And what we can see from that red line is conditions as of the moment for a U.S. new vehicle buyer are probably one of the best levels since the early 1990s. So that's telling us that U.S. vehicle sales are going to continue to strengthen over the next several years, which is obviously a big positive for a region uh, for like Durham, given the importance of General Motors and all the parts suppliers in this region. Uh, and, and as you can see, one of the conditions that's happened is that because of this positive outlook, we've seen a big uh, increase in vehicle production across North America. So here in Durham, what we've seen more recently is that General Motors has actually added a shift or will be adding a shift to their Oshawa plant and because demand for some of their products were so strong they actually delayed the closing of one of their lines which was originally scheduled for 2013 to 2014. So both obviously fair important developments and because of the strong uh, leading indicators that we're seeing, what we're expecting is that by 2014 you will actually see vehicle production across North America at the highest level since 2010. So definitely a positive going forward. However, there are 
some problems. And that is that while we are bouncing back quite nicely here in North America, if you look at where we were uh, a decade ago, so back in 2000, North America used to produce you know, 17, 18 million vehicles. We're basically going to be back at that level over the next couple of years, but we used to account for roughly 30% of global vehicle production. The key point here is by the time we get to that same level uh, by 2014, we won't be beyond 18%. So there's been a dramatic shift in production increases outside of North America so that our share of the global total has fallen significantly. While we're back to normal production levels, that share of the global total has shrunk dramatically. And that's certainly the case here in Canada. You know, we used to produce 3 million. Uh, this year we'll produce 2.5. Next year we'll produce 2.6 million. But we used to be 5% of the global total. Now we will not go beyond 3%. So that just highlights the change within that industry. While conditions are positive going forward, there is a lot of other things going on in, uh, under the surface so that our share has, has shrunk dramatically. And that's certainly the case in auto parts as well. If you look at Canada, we used to be one of the top 10 auto parts exporters in the world. We used to have a market share where we were about 6%. That has shrunk significantly, so that our market share now is roughly about 3%, and we are no longer in the top 10 auto parts manufacturers in the world. We have, I think we're down at 11 or 12 now. So that is one thing that, that you have to keep in mind, is that there are significant changes going on in this industry, notwithstanding the improvement that we're seeing. And in particular, if you look at our share of exports that are going to the emerging markets. These are the markets where you're seeing the fastest growth and, well you, and where you will see most of the growth come going forward. Our share has shrunk, has shrunk significantly. We used to be about 2% of our exports used to be destined to those markets. Now we're lucky if we have 1%. So that's an area where we have to work significantly to improve. And that's something that our American friends have certainly done much better than we have. They used to have close to 3% of their exports. Now they're closer to 4.5%. So they've certainly been working at developing exports to the emerging markets much better than we have as Canadians, and in particular than the auto sector has. And if you look at the global economy, you know, we tend to think of North America, Europe as really being the dominant. And that historically, that was the case. And they still account for, uh, if you account Europe as a whole with North America, it's about, we're about 40% of the global total. But if you take Asia uh, together, they're probably in the high 30s as well. And then we have Latin America, which is about 8% or so. So all I'm really trying to highlight here is, historically, the auto sector in Canada as a whole has relied primarily on the U.S. market as its key source of exports. That, uh, that area has only now shrunk to roughly 20% of the global total. So we specifically have an opportunity to go after business for, from about, that account for about 80% of overall global uh, economic activity that we have not done a good job at, uh, at and captivating uh, very well. Uh, Kathy had mentioned how the uh, region here, how the economic development area had focused on trying to uh, get partnerships with China and so forth, and that's definitely a step in the right direction, and it's those type of things that we have to see to continue in order to broaden the export base for Durham and for Canada as a whole. The other point here is, so just one chart is the GDP, and the other one is just the population basis. If you look at the developed world, we're basically, you know, about 800 million people. Uh, look at the size of China, it's 1.3 billion. Look at India, it's 1.2. 
But, I mean, everybody knows those types of numbers. But I think the key point is, even if you think outside of China, outside of India, think of the rest of Asia, and you still have roughly about 1.3, 1.4 billion people there as well. So that just puts you into con in, in perspective in terms of the opportunities that do uh, exist out there. And lastly, my last chart is just going to be looking at economic cycles. And I talked a little bit about leading indicators being very important in getting a sense as to where we're going. One of the indicators that we have developed is what I call financial conditions index. It essentially looks at things such as the TED spread, which is highlighted earlier, plus a few other things, just to give you a sense as to uh, what is the outlook for the global economy. And as I pointed out earlier, most of those indicators that we track are positive. It has sort of moderating, so it's telling you that growth is not picking up. It's, it's uh, essentially, uh, you know, at current levels or maybe improving a little bit, but not much more. But the point here is that if you look at that black, li uh, black line and you see those shaded areas and the uh, financial conditions index, always goes negative prior to an economic downturn. And looking at where we are currently, we are currently at a fairly decent level. We're moderating, but still positive. And I think that's really the key that I'm bringing here. We all worry about growth being slow, but that's the nature of this cycle. We can't change that. But, so it's important, though, to recognize where we are in that cycle. And most of the indicators that I track, whether it's things such as our proprietary indicators, whether it's indicators from other institutions, such as the OECD or the leading economic indicators for the U.S., all of them are saying the same thing. Global growth will continue. It will be slow, but we are not going down the into a sharp downturn, as many people tell you on TV. So it's, it, that's, I think, the key point. There are risks out there, and one of, the thing, one of, the, one of them is obviously the, fisc, the U.S. fiscal cliff. What will happen there? Our view is that we will not go over the cliff because it essentially is a political decision, and we're expecting to have some compromise between the two uh, parties before the end of the year, but it definitely is a risk, and it would be irresponsible for them not to come to a, a, a solution. So, but the, the key point that I want to leave you with is all of the indicators we track remain positive, and definitely we're expecting continued growth for North America in the order of 2% for China, probably moving closer to seven and, uh, sorry, from 7.5 this year to closer to 8% uh, next year, and for the global economy, probably accelerating from that 3% this year, maybe a little bit closer to 35 uh, Thank you for your time.